My friends Paul and Gail were getting married, and they were my first real adult friends. The first friends that you make like when you're out of college, when you don't have all of your friends, you know, in the same classes with you or living right nearby you. So they were getting married and I really wanted to go to the wedding, but I had just moved to Los Angeles and they were still living in Boston. And I was incredibly broke. So I didn't think I was gonna be able to make it to the wedding. And Paul and Gail met because they both loved The Who, the band The Who. And they met at a, they met at a used record store looking at Who albums, and then they ran into each other at a Who concert, and then they started dating. So they were very involved with The Who. And I was here in Los Angeles, and I was trying to figure out, I was looking for the universe to give me a sign that I could go to their wedding. And I found in a used record store, and this was a while ago when there were still a lot of used record stores, I found a first printing of the album Quadrophenia. And the first printing, as I think we all know, was the one that was in Holland. So it was uh, gray instead of dark. When they started printing them in West Germany and the US, the background got a lot darker. But this was the gray one, the first generation from Holland. And I bought it because I thought Paul and Gail would love it. And then I had a friend who was working for a music management company that managed The Who. And the members of The Who, and at the time there were still three of them, were going to be in Los Angeles and I begged and pleaded with my friend to let me come in and have them sign this first release of Quadrophenia. And finally he did and I had to wait around for a very, very long time and I'd parked at a meter and I was convinced I was going to get a ticket. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting and finally someone brought me into this room and there's... Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey and John Entwistle, and they're all really pissed. They're really fucking annoyed with each other and with me. And they say, Pete Townsend says, what have you got? And I hold up the first generation Dutch copy of Quadrophenia. And Pete Townsend looks at John Entwistle and says, oh, that's when we used to make good records. And John Entwistle looks back at Townsend and says, yeah, that's when you used to write good songs. And then Roger Daltrey, I guess, trying to be the peacemaker, says, that's when I had really great hair. <laughs> Which is true. And they signed it one by one, and Daltrey was the last one who signed it. And finally, after he signed it, he said, I'm really good at doing Keith's signature. If you want, I can just sign Keith's name which seemed really weird because Keith was dead. And that, and that just seemed wrong to me. So I said, no, thank you, that's, that's enough. And he handed it back to me, but he seemed really disappointed. And then I had, I had this record and it was signed by all of the living members of The Who, which seemed to me to be a sign that I should go to this wedding. And I went to a travel agent because this is a long time ago and there were still travel agents. And uh, I looked at flying back to Boston and it was so incredibly expensive that I didn't think that I could swing it. And then that night I came home and a friend of mine called me and said, I have a car that I need someone to drive to Hartford. And I said, yes, because Hartford is not very far away from Boston. And so I got the car and I'm a Virgo, so I planned how long it would take me to get there and where I would have to stop. And I had no money, so I planned this so that I could stay with people along the way and then the last night sleep at a rest area. And I got in the car and I was making good time. I'd built in a contingency because I'm a Virgo. And I was actually an hour or two ahead of schedule spent the night in Colorado Springs with some friends, took off early the next morning, and I was driving through Kansas. Kansas is not an interesting state. I wanted to get through it as fast as possible. But again, I didn't have any money. So I was trying to avoid going on the turnpike because I wanted to save those seven or eight dollars. And there was a highway that paralleled the turnpike, but it was about four or five miles away from it, and I thought, perfect, 
I'll just go on this highway. And I'm driving on the highway, and I don't see any cars for hours and hours and hours. And then I'm going up this hill, and I see a little bit of smoke coming out from under the hood, which is not a good sign. And this is a long time ago, so I didn't have a cell phone, and most people didn't have cell phones. And I looked at the side of the road, and there was no place where I could pull over. So I thought, I'll just crest this hill, and I'll go down the other side, and then there will be some place where I can stop. And when I got to the top of the hill, I noticed that there were flames coming out from the steering column, which is really not a good sign. So even though there wasn't really a shoulder, I pulled over and thought, this is bad. I have to do something about it. So I tried blowing the fire out, which, as you might imagine, didn't work very well. And then I got out of the car, and there's no one around. And I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell am I going to do? And then this guy pulls over, who actually has a cell phone, but it's, you know, it's a long time ago, so it's one of those big brick cell phones and he calls the police and the fire department and I go into the back of the car and I get my my bag with my clothes out and then I grab the copy of Quadrophenia and then the car proceeds to become completely engulfed in flames and then I move a little bit farther away from it and then the gas tank explodes. And the cops come, and the fire department comes, and I am in the middle of freaking nowhere. And by the time I finish dealing with my friend whose car it was, over the phone, the insurance company, the police, and the fire department, I had burned through, no pun intended, my contingency for the extra time I had allotted. And finally, the cop who was taking the report said, well, where do you want to go? And I said, Boston, because I was hopeful. And he said, no, where do you want to go here? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, I know a motel. I'll take you there. And he drove me to this motel. And then I spent the next two hours. It was by this point 3 or 3.30 in the morning. I spent the next two hours on the phone to airlines because there was no internet back then or at least not to speak of, trying to arrange a flight to get back to Boston. And all of the flights were like $1,200, which I couldn't afford. And I thought, I'm going to have to call Paul and Gail and tell them that I can't come to their wedding, which I didn't want to do because they were my first real adult friends and I wanted to be there. And I told the clerk at the front desk of the uh, motel what was going on. And she was like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. It's, it's going to be rough. And then at 5.30 in the morning, I hear this big banging on my door. And I get up, and it's the clerk. And he says, I've been on the CB radio. Because, again, it's a long time ago. I've been on the CB radio, and I know a friend of a friend who drives a truck who's going to New Hampshire and he's gonna be here in 20 minutes. I got dressed and I grabbed all of my stuff and I grabbed the copy of Quadrophenia, which was made in Holland and was gray instead of black. And the, the truck driver comes out and he was like this big, obnoxious guy who drove really, really fast. And I, at one point I said to him, can you slow down a little? And he said, nope. <laughs> and he said, if you want, you can get out a little. And I said, no, that's OK. And I then went to sleep because it was just too terrifying to be awake while he was driving. And I woke up, and we had actually made up all of the time I had lost by having the car explode. And I bought him breakfast the next morning, and I told him all about Paul and Gail. And, the Quadrophenia thing and about the members of the WHO and what they'd said. And he said, you know, I believe in love. And I said, okay. 
and he said, it's out of my way, but I'm going to drive you to that wedding. And we drove all day, and I got to the church 10 minutes before Paul and Gail's wedding was going to start, and I had, I had changed in the cab, and I was wearing a suit and everything, and I got out of the, the truck, and I thanked the guy, and, and uh, I started walking off, and then I hear this big truck horn right outside the, the thing, and, and he looks at me, and he says, uh, you forgot your record, and he hands me the copy of Quadrophenia, but his hands are all, like, wet from drinking stuff, and he smeared John Entwistle's signature, but he hands it to me, and I got there in time to be there for my friends Paul and Gail, who got married, and I gave them this copy of Quadrophenia, which had made it through all of the last resorts of me not thinking I'd be able to get to the wedding, and I gave it to them for a wedding present, and they framed it, and they put it in their living room, and they are still married, and it is still there. So every time you go into their living room, you see Quadrophenia with Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey, and John Entwistle just a little bit smudged. Thank you.